I'm Commander Shepard, and this is my favorite lore cast on the Citadel. Welcome to the Mass Effect Lorecast, the podcast where we explore the vast universe of lore behind the Mass Effect games. We'll talk about all the details you may have missed, ask the hard questions, and more. Commander Shepard, welcome back to the Mass Effect Lorecast. This is your host, Tom, or Robots, and I'm here with my very hungry companion, N7 Legend. N7, how's your dinner? How's it going? It's going well. I've uh, every Sunday is a very long day for me, mm-hmm. so I'm waking up at five a.m. I'm working from six a.m. and to two p.m. in my day job, and then after that, I'm prepping for this show, and then we're doing this show. Huh. So it's like sixteen-hour days, I think. And uh, I don't have time for dinner, but that's a long-winded way of saying that tonight I'm eating shepherd's pie for dinner. Commander shepherd's pie. (laughs) This is, I don't know how to say this. This is shepherd's pie as a dish. (laughs) I'm not making a euphemism. (laughs) Does it, mm, does it taste (laughs) like commander shepherd? I got to say, if it did, I think Commander Shepard needs to shower. (laughs) Wait, (laughs) what does it taste like? Oh, wait, Shepard's pie? Yeah. I mean, does it it, it taste like mashed potatoes and and, like meat and stuff? And yeah, and and beef and corn and gravy. Okay, so like you're you're implying that Commander Shepard was like rolling around in food and so therefore he needs to take a shower. (laughs) <laughs> or she but yes yeah yeah he or she, she. okay okay all right okay this is good. this is getting real weird yes okay anyway hey welcome back to the mass effect food channel um th- so anyway <laughs> gosh this is really this is the weirdest <laughs> intro we've ever done this is the mass effect lore cast this is the show where we talk about all the lore behind the galaxy of information of mass effect normally if this is your first episode i'm sorry we don't normally talk about food tasting like commander shepherd but uh today we will be talking about the justicars and the asari commandos this is going to be a pretty badass episode i feel now that we've moved on from shepherd's pie w- what do you think n7 I think this is going to be one of our more badass episodes, but you know, we have uh, quite a lot of morality to talk about as well. Oh, it's one of those, eh? Indeed it is. And you know, this topic, it actually comes as a request from one of our listeners. They heard us doing the factions, you know, STG, the Alliance, you know, inspectors in sevens and said, okay, but what about the Asari? So... Today, we're going to talk about the rigid warrior monks, the blue knights of the Milky Way, the kick-ass pseudo-vigilantes, the Justicars. But we're also going to talk about the Asari military doctrine and the Asari commandos and how those all intertwine. Cool. I mean, it makes sense because as with a lot of these, it seems like that stuff intertwines, that oftentimes these specific groups tend to come out of other specific groups with the military and there's connections there. If I've learned anything from these other episodes, they don't just kind of spawn out of nowhere. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And I, I think I'm actually happy that we covered the Asari before. I think it was like episode six or seven or eight. I can't remember which one, but I'm happy that we did before because uh, a lot of this stuff is cumulative. I was just talking with a couple of our listeners and a couple of my friends in chat before this episode. And so much of what we're about to talk about is cumulative that we laid the foundation of understanding weeks and weeks and weeks ago, you know, months ago at this point, um, but uh, yeah, um, like half a year ago, a year ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like a long time ago. Um, yeah. Okay, cool, cool. So, and, and speaking of old traditions uh, dying hard, I have a motto for the Justicars as well. Um, it's a quote, the eternal difference between right and wrong does not fluctuate. It is immutable. 
That's a quote from Patrick Henry. I chose it because the Justicars are as rigid as the day is long. And although I support some of Patrick Henry's ideas, that one is like very rigid. <laughs> that, yeah. that one doesn't uh, really account for a lot of life circumstances. And um, bonus one, if you don't want to be lonely, don't try to be right. Which it does seem like the Justicars are rather lonely and they are always trying to do what's right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I, um, I feel like some of my Mass Effect playthroughs have kind of resonated with that a little bit. I feel like sometimes, sometimes the things I do often make for like, oh, poor Shepard, no relationships for you. I totally get that. I just had uh, <laughs> like my first Mass Effect 3 celibate playthrough, uh, like last, so last playthrough. And I was trying to romance Tally, but ultimate spoiler alert, but ultimately I, I couldn't, um, I couldn't bring my shepherd to lie and cover up the truth to the entire migrant fleet just to save what? To save her ego? Right. To save right. her family's loyalty, like, like right. her family's name? Like, sorry, I'm not going to do that. That's that's wrong. Right. Like, oh, this and, one person cares about this one thing so much. Or I could do the right thing here. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. But I like the way that the writers put that in there because doing what's right is not going to make you friends all the time. So, right. It's yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, but beyond that, um, you know, let's talk about the Justicars. Yeah. So, you know? so, okay. So let's explain to everyone uh, who the Justicars are. Uh, are they military? Is there a chain of command? Like, how does this all work? So they're not military and they're not law enforcement per se, um, but they have a very particular set of skills, right? Uh, no, they, 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 it, <laughs> they, they are oddly similar to Liam Neeson and Taken. Uh, they just kind of show up out of nowhere. They kick a lot of ass. They don't really explain who they are. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> okay no they have a singular no. mission yeah but they they do have a singular mission and that's to right wrongs you know um they are incredibly skilled in combat and have advanced biotics and what's more is they are incredibly knowledgeable they are a group of warrior monks who wander a sorry space writing wrongs so like that right wrongs thing they're jedi yeah they're like jedi but dicks they're like dick well I mean, a lot of Jedi were kind of dicks. They kind of were. They kind of were. The Jedi didn't deal in absolutes, right? That was the one well, thing. Well, mm, you go back to the prequel trilogy and they say they didn't. Like the statement, Jedi don't deal in absolutes, is itself an absolute. That's fair. That's very <laughs> like, fair. Um, do you guys not realize the irony in this statement? Come on. But the Justicars do. They definitely do deal in absolutes. Um, they will get to a little bit more of that, that, that moral gray area versus uh, absolutes in a little bit. But first, I want to describe kind of how they operate. And the Justicars are lone wolves. There's never like a team of Justicars. They just go independently places and then they fight crime and that can be against Asari or non Asari. Mainly it's going to be Asari because it's in Asari space. So, but, mm -hmm. and you know, any Asari who enters the ranks of the Justicar, this is from the codex, any Asari who enters the ranks of the Justicars has already spent centuries in a combination of criminal investigation, military intel and combat experience. So the collective body, quote, the collective body of Justicar knowledge exceeds even that of Spectres. That's how like smart these Justicars are. That's intense. That they, they know so much about the galaxy and, and the power spheres and who controls what and what can work against this opponent and this type of scenario. You know, they can MacGyver their way out of any situation, I, I'm guessing. Um, so yeah it's 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 pretty pretty intense they're they're um they're described as being you know we we just said you know are they paragon or renegade basically mm -hmm. well their methods range from according to the codex their methods range from subtle where possible to brutal where necessary so it's like a range of neutral to renegade okay but not totally renegade because they're more like the ultimate lawful neutral right okay 
So you, I know that you've played a lot of D and D. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I think a lot of our listeners probably have as well. Um, but maybe you can explain what lawful neutral is. Yeah. So, okay. So if you have a grid, right. And on the axis, you've got, uh, like up and down and left and right. Right. And up and down, uh, like at the top of the grid is good. And at the bottom of the grid is evil. And then in the middle is neutral. Right. So if you're at the top, you're you're good. You do things for morally good reasons. And at the bottom, you do things for like evil reasons, like you want the world to burn. Right. And then on the left side of the grid is uh, lawful, which means you follow the rules. And on the right side is chaos. And then in the middle is, again, like neutral. So to the left, you would be. Well, you, you know, I follow the rules to the right. You're again, you kind of want the world to burn. Like you, you just do what you want, regardless of what the rules say, but not necessarily want the world to burn. Like you can't use that phrase twice to mean two things. Um, so, for example, if you were at the top, the left side of the grid, you would be lawful good, which means that you do things for what you think are the right reasons and you follow the rules. But you could also do things for what you think are the right reasons and do them chaotically, which would be the top right side of the grid. Makes sense. So in D&D, oftentimes you would describe a character based on where they are placed in this grid. Somebody in the very center of the grid would be just kind of totally neutral. They don't choose to be either good or evil. They don't choose to be either lawful or chaotic. They simply do what they want because that's what they want with no regard to any system at all. And so they, they fit on this grid in different places. So what you're talking about is them being. Say that again lawful neutral lawful neutral so they would be lawful so they'd be on the left side of the grid but then they're not good or evil they'd be in the middle so they'd be the far left side in the middle yeah yeah exactly so they're really not it's more about just and unjust not about right and wrong per se Mm -hmm. so Uh, they follow the rules but the the morality doesn't have anything to do with their decision right their moralities are based upon the rules Right. Is, is, yeah, that's basically what we're saying. And so Samara in Mass Effect 2, Samara, the only Justicar that we really play with in the games, she's more subtle compared to another former Justicar, Tristana, who we will, uh, we will talk about her a little bit toward the end of the episode. Yeah. Um, speaking of Samara, Cloudy Atlas in chat says uh, Samara is more than a vehicle of righteousness. She is just a car. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm glad that we were able to outsource our puns mm-hmm. for tonight. That mm-hmm. was, that was the, the dad joke for tonight, everyone. Yeah. All of our puns will be brought to you by our chat, our live chat. We'll be bringing you the puns tonight. So, um, so you said any Asari can attempt to become a Justicar? Yeah. So an interesting distinction that we make here, right? With it being an Asari. So only Asari, it seems, can be just a cars. Uh, but any Asari can attempt to become a just car. Um, there are a few things that are needed, however. Number one, you can't have any children and you can't have a family. So like Jedi. Immediate, immediately, I'm thinking of Jedi. I'm also thinking of superheroes like, you know, they hide their identity to protect the ones they love right. or they just don't have loved ones. Right, right. So, yeah, they're not allowed to have vulnerabilities, apparently. Um, And one might think, is that because the people that would want to harm them could use it as leverage? But for the Justicars, I think it's something different. And that's because uh, in addition to giving up everything, they also have to abide by this code. But they give up everything except for their weapons and armor. And Mm. when I've reflected on that i've wondered okay so they're traveling around asari space they're just going around from place to place righting wrongs right um but they've given up everything so does that mean they've given up their homes as well i mean they don't have a family so they don't have anything to go back to yeah yeah so they're homeless right well like a wandering monk like this is a very kind of like i don't know eastern kind of thing also a uh, in my opinion kind of a trite uh D D or fantasy kind of sure trope yeah, yeah like the, the wandering adventurer who's uh you know off to right the wrongs and you know yeah yeah 
the mysterious stranger. Yeah. Uh, that kind of thing. So, and most importantly, my lady, (laughs) (laughs) for anybody not watching the live version of this, he put his hand to his head, like he was tipping his hat. (laughs) And all of a sudden he's got like a chin beard and a fedora and he's saying (laughs) my (laughs) lady. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I guess the the, the 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 visual cue didn't work well for an audio medium. Um, go figure. Uh, but most importantly, the 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 Justicars they they must swear an oath to the code of the Justicars, and it dictates every part of their lives. It it does not leave any gray areas whatsoever. Yeah, so the law they follow the law to the T. Like the law dictates everything. Is kind of what you're saying there, right? Right. Well, their code anyway, uh, right. which is separate from okay. the law. Right. So what is the code then? I wish I had a more comprehensive answer for you, but <laughs> unfortunately we don't know because it is. So what we do know, it is, it is a strict series of instructions. It teaches them how to behave in every situation, every situation imaginable. So it's a protocol for being just. Mm hmm. And by just, I mean, you know, justice, like, like just, mm-hmm. um, so they're like, fi- wait, wait, wait. So they're like judge dread. Yeah. That's a great way to put it. Actually. Yeah, they are. They're like um, a judge. They're like a, you know, judge, jury and executioner. Yes, 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 yes. They are like an old computer, lots of rules and no forgiveness. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so they, they have 5,000 lines in that code which are called sutras. Uh, We don't know all of them because uh, I know this might be hard to imagine, but Bioware actually didn't want to write 5,000 lines (laughs) of lore code just for the Justicars, you know? Um, So that, yeah, we don't know actually all 5,000 lines and we don't know actually any of them verbatim as far as I know. We know some of their oaths, which are different, and we'll get into that. But we don't know the lines verbatim, but but the Justicars do. And this is the thing about the code. They're so obsessed with it and, it, and this is where it kind of becomes like a cult. They're so obsessed with it, they have to have all 5,000 lines memorized. Mm-hmm. All of them. Mm-hmm. And they can be quizzed at any moment by another Justicar. Presumably, if they fail that quiz, they have failed the code. And then it is up to the other Justicar to seek whatever punishment is necessary for being unjust. Like, like murdering them? Maybe. Maybe. Like, <laughs> maybe. Like, what is line 2753, Justicar? <laughs> yeah, yeah. When ordering a pizza, never order pineapple. <laughs> you may live. When, Good answer. When attempting a Darwin's Finch's rock concert never speak out of turn (laughs) always pass after two puffs (laughs) you may live good answer just a car (laughs) happy hunting (laughs) or whatever right Um, right this is how rigid they are and it's hard not to you know imagine them like computers right because because of how rigid they are and then they're he's almost as rigid as legion um, mm-hmm. but this he is how rigid basically they are. a computer. I mean, yeah, yeah. They, it's a it's a series of protocols. They literally call it the code. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Computer code. Yeah, yeah. Totally. Yeah. I see where you're going um, there. Yeah. So this is how rigid they are. For example, let's say that there is a group of innocent people. Um, for for argument's sake, a school of high or a bus full of high school age children who are being attacked by monsters. The Justicar code would say we need to go and help them, right? And the, and the Justicar will defend an innocent. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. let's say that during the course of the of the defense and killing the monsters, the Justicar learns that a few of those high schoolers are drug dealers. Uh huh. Sorry, guess who's getting killed? <laughs> right, right. Or the monsters are worshipped as like religious, you know, f- like figures. Right, right, right. Like, so, like, like cows in India or something like that. And it's like, oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Can't touch like these. They'll, they'll defend the innocents and then they will like prosecute the innocents if they are not innocent. 
Right. Um, right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so how did, how did this begin? How did the Justicar whole, how did this whole thing start? Um, we don't really know, to be honest, you know, they're not really, we, there's no specifics anyway. Um, so the next part is going to be a little bit of speculation, uh, because they are the monastic order. We're going to take a couple things that we all already know. They are a monastic order, meaning they are an order of monks, basically because they are an order of monks and because they're required to know this code by heart. My best guess is that there was one highly trained Asari commando or badass or general, you know, like awesome person who adopted a very strict ideology. And this was just their worldview. And then that separated them from a, from a, from a larger group. So they went off and formed their own new group. And then they mm -hmm. trained others in their code, in their way. And see, so you can see where we're going with this. So they're right. creating their own order, right? This, by the way, this is how many world religions or philosophies start is that somebody breaks from some tradition and does their own thing and it becomes notable and then other people want to learn it because they stand right. out from everyone else. So like Siddhartha Gautama, the original Buddha, uh, did this. Uh, and was like, no, I'm going to live my life, life differently. And the people were like, why? What are you doing? What, you're, you're like, who is this weirdo? What, what are they doing? And he's like, I'm trying to cause no pain. And they're like, why? And he's like, because that's the right thing to do. And he lived such a different life that people became very curious about it. And then people were like, well, teach me how to do this. And then that turned into a whole thing. Um, you know, Confucius, a similar kind of thing. Uh, Jesus, very similar kind of thing. Um, and this happens over and over and over again throughout world history is that you have somebody who does something notably different and then all of a sudden given enough time that becomes like memorialized and they become some sort of huge figure that if, an yeah. entire system grows out of just like something like this. So, yeah, that could that could be a very real theory for how something yeah. like this would, would come about. I also kind of thought because of how militant they are, I, I thought about the Knights Templar. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's actually Samara likens herself to, and her order to the Knights Errant of the medieval times in, on earth, which is amazing by the way, because we just said how these, how the Justicars are equipped with an incredibly broad range of knowledge and Samara is already aware of medieval history on earth Yeah, enough to make wow. that comparison to Shepard. So right. this is a lore friendly thing that she's saying. It's not like a, a writing device. Right, right. Yeah. Like, let me use something that you'll be familiar with from your own world, Shepard. <laughs> this is how much smarter I am than you, Shepard. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> because I don't think Shepard knows anything about medieval history on Thessia. <laughs> oh, right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Let me tell you about your own history from, you know, five to six hundred years ago. <laughs> Yeah, that was essentially Samara dumbing it down <laughs> for right, Shepard. Right. Um, but yeah, and so there's the code, right? There's the 5,000 lines of code. But there are also these things called the Oaths of Subsummation. And they are the basic tenets that we learn from Samara about what it means to be a Justicar, protecting the innocent, punishing the guilty, and defending law and order as it currently is. Mm -hmm. And these are the oaths. Basically, all of, they are basically all the values that the Justicars swear to do and uphold. And the, the, the really surprising part to me when I was researching this episode was that these oaths actually came after the Justicar order was created, after there were already Justicars around. Hmm. And here's how we know this. The Codex says Justicars traveled alone because they didn't need much help. They were just so fucking awesome. They didn't need it. <laughs> okay. Um, and, 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 but that made them cocky and that led to some issues. So quote, the, 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 the Codex says, quote, the conflicts presented by such arrogance prompted the Justicar order to develop the oaths of subsummation. The effect of the oaths is conservative, ensuring that Justicars respect the existing distribution of Asari power rather than staging a coup to rearrange society according to Justicar satisfaction. Nevertheless, the possibility of such an attack is a source of anxiety and counterintelligence among the Asari elite. So this tells us a lot about how the Asari or the Justicar order was and then how it became 
because this, I would imagine, inside Justicar circles is kind of like a reformation type period. Mm -hmm. Like there must have been some seriously renegade Justicars for this to become a thing, right? That they're like, oh, we're going to rope them in. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Mm. And, and and so that kind of also begs the question because you asked, how did they come about? Well, why did they come about? Why did the just cars become necessary in the first place? Maybe because like we said uh, in an earlier episode, a sorry, a sorry society progresses culturally very slowly and it's inherently stable for that reason. There's not a lot of radical change left and right, you know, authoritarian, libertarian. It, it was just very stable. So it's not prone to radical change. And that makes sense given their lengthy lifespans. They like to sit on their hands to address issues, right? It's not really pressing to them. Mm -hmm. um, but we know crime still exists. Nevertheless, crime has al always existed in Asari space. So my question is, given their slow to adopt change culture, given their in, in very stable culture, how long do court cases take? Yeah, yeah, hundreds of years, maybe. In our society, which, you know, comparatively changes on a dime all the time, how long does it take to get into the actual courtroom when you've been charged oh, yeah. with something? Oh, yeah, yeah, months, years, sometimes. Yeah, like, yeah, depending on what it yeah. is. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and, and so, you know, um, the crime exists on, in a sorry space and now we have court cases that are perhaps whereas they might take a year for us they might take 10 years or 100 years yeah, for right. sorry decades yeah um i would imagine the people who are being wronged are getting pretty pissed off <laughs> waiting for that um granted it's not all that long to them but it's still a lot of time and how long we talked about it a little bit before with the Asari government and, and whatnot. Um, but they have all inclusive, all citizen legislatures. It's like an all volunteer democracy where they don't really have a leg legislature, mm -hmm. but they like everyone who's an Asari citizen is invited to debate things. Right. And sometimes those debates, I imagine, because it's so open ended, it's like an electronic democracy, but those debates, oh my God, how long would those take? Oh, yeah, they probably go on forever. It's yeah. Forever. And yet there are some issues that don't really care about how long a sorry lifespans are, you know, like an asteroid coming to your planet. That's a pressing issue. I'm not sure a just car can fix that, but yeah. you get the point. You yeah. know, um, there could be one or two potentially really bad people who are causing destruction very fast. Right. And can you, can you imagine being part of like an HOA? Like a homeowners association for a sorry. No, I can't. Like, I don't want to. Like, I don't want to imagine. Like the argument about like, well, our neighbors painted their fence the wrong color would take like weeks. <laughs> like, oh my <laughs> God. <laughs> yeah. You know, I found it offensive that they used indigo instead of violet. Yeah. Your dog has been pooping on my lawn. <laughs> like this. Well, it took yeah. a month to res resolve that last dog pooping on the lawn issue. Yeah, Let's move like, on to the next hey, issue. You know, the, the, um, the dog pooping on the lawn happened a millennia ago. I think it's time you let that go. I think it's time to move on to the next issue. <laughs> yeah, they don't forget. That's for sure. But yeah, the, like I said, for, for much of their history, there was no large government. There were more lo loose groupings of city states, you know, um, very loose groupings of re republics, basically. So who has the cross border authority in those types of scenarios? Is It's an easy way for criminals to escape the law, right? You just run from one city state to another if there's no overarching authority between the two. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and and we're talking about extradition. We're talking about extradition, maybe in a, in a society that is slow to progress anything normal court cases could take forever yeah <laughs> and extraditing a criminal i don't even know how that would work or or yeah i don't think you ever want to get arrested for anything because you probably would just sit in a cell waiting for anything to happen like the the time it takes to even get to the court case is probably longer than the sentence for so many different kinds of things oh my god yeah it's like the dmv everywhere 
Yeah. <laughs> Heck yeah. Even just going to the DMV probably takes forever. Like, congratulations. It's the equivalent of your 16th birthday. You can you can drive now. Hopefully you'll be able to get your license if you sit here long enough and you'll, you turn 20. <laughs> we need an Asari Elcor DMV joke. Oh, my God. Oh. The, <laughs> the, the, the Asari only hire the Elcor at the DMV because that's because they're the only ones with patience long enough to sit there and actually check in the other Asari. <laughs> Growing frustratedly, sir, I need you to remain calm. <laughs> you are number 5,472 million. <laughs> Please remain seated. <laughs> That's not a real number. It is in my book. <laughs> Internally laughing. Please return when you get the correct documentation. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that that point about extradition, like it would it would take even longer, assuming that those two republics like each other or, or not assuming that they like each other. Like if they didn't like each other, how long would that extradition take? So that that all what I just mentioned about the crime, the inclusive, all inclusive, you know, however long debates, the, uh, you know, extradition, cross border authority issues. All of that combined with a slow legal process and a slow to change culture and some things I feel like, you know, matriarchs may not be willing to do. And maybe this gap, this gridlock in prog like progress and needing a quick judge, jury and executioner mm -hmm. created a need for a fast acting extra extrajudicial uh, vigilante. That makes sense. It makes sense. Somebody who can be just out there just following up on what needs to happen in order to get stuff done. Right. Yeah. It has long been criticized as the weakness of democracies that they cannot respond to crises fast enough. Right. 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 And especially and in a system like this, it sounds like like this is the the worst case version of that. The penultimate democracy. Yeah. 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 So they would definitely need a more extreme, uh, fast acting extra judicial uh, group. Right. And a whole bunch of Judge Dreads just out there, you know, taking people on. Right. And how much better for the existing democracies if the uh, Judge Dreads just, you know, happen to also swear to never stage a coup? Yeah. Well, so, yeah. Yeah. But they're also, you know, they're more the Justicars are more of a group of individuals than any organization. So maybe that's why they've also skated by, uh, because there are a bunch of lone wolves who are bound by code, not hierarchy. They don't have a hierarchy. Mm -hmm. They just they're not, they don't get told what to do. They don't take orders. They just take orders from the code. Right, right. There's no fear of somebody organizing them and then using that power. Right. They can't be mobilized, not like a military. Um, right. So and, and they're always going to uphold that common law, pres preserving existing governments. Um, so they might strike against individual ne'er do wells or corrupt people within government, but they're never going to stage a revolt. Yeah. And um, and and probably they could in any way, because there's not many justicars to start with. Uh, there are so few actually. So we're, there's so few in the galaxy that people are genuinely shocked when they see one, um, somewhat like specters. Why? You know, I'm not surprised there are a few. Um, I'm really not surprised there are a few because like we just said, think about all, all of what it takes to become a just car. You gotta not have kids, not have a family. You got to give up all of your stuff. Yeah. Can't have a home. You got to travel around constantly and just writing wrongs and living your life to the T on this 5,000 line protocol book, which you also have to memorize at all times. Right. Right. And you have to follow the law. You can't just do what you want. Right. And, and if you do, I mean, maybe the law enforcement will look the other way. Maybe they won't. I mean, but the thing is, like, that just straight up does not sound like a good time. <laughs> no, <laughs> if yeah, I'm gonna, to, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. And there's so many other lucrative things, qual big quality of life per paths that you can take. This almost sounds like a thankless public, public service job. Right. You have to be very, very driven by, like, belief in this code. 
or with nothing else to live for i think like yeah. someone searching for purpose right would probably be drew, drawn to this uh which is you know maybe how samara got there in the first place we'll talk about that a little bit more when we do an episode all about samara mm -hmm. but samara is our main source for the knowledge about just cars mm -hmm. she is the primary filter through which we gain the understanding of what just cars are um as i mentioned earlier there's also tristana uh from mass effect foundation a former just car who had a thing with zaid they dated um but then zaid ultimately broke it off and zaid called described her as a stone cold bitch uh, which you probably have to be to be a just a car and the interesting thing was she was a former just a car so that means that you can leave the order <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> kind of surprising to me because yeah. I would imagine that if you tried to leave that kind of order, they'd be like, you are no longer bound by the code. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You will die now. <laughs> right. Like <laughs> code rule number 4,999. Those no longer bound by the code are no longer bound by life. <laughs> <laughs> right. Like, right. That we are not bound to honor your pursuit <laughs> of life. <laughs> right. Yeah. And then there's four up. Uh, Fora, we never meet in the games. We only know about Fora because of an email on Lessus. Uh, that's the, the planet where the monastery, where the Ardot Yakshi are taken mm -hmm. in Mass Effect 3. Mm -hmm. um, and Fora uh, apparently scared the shit out of the Ardot Yakshi to get them to go with her willingly uh, <laughs> to that to that monastery. Like, like she scared them to the point where management of the monastery did not like her <laughs> because <laughs> because she kept dropping off these traumatized Ardot Ard Yakshis like, <laughs> like too scared. <laughs> Man. But um, yeah, so what we know, basically, uh, you know, we don't really know uh, a lot of just cars to begin with. So what we know is greatly limited by our lack of sources. Maybe not all just cars are like Samara. Yeah, well, as with anything, if you only have one source of information, it kind of gets filtered through that one person's view rather than, you know, an actual real interpretation of of the thing right so um but yeah it seems like a very limited group anyway it's it's a very small very elite group and you know it's so small that um there's some speculation that after the reaper war they might not even exist anymore yeah wow well wow. yeah it'd be interesting to have the actual numbers you know like how many were they at their height how many were there mm. you know are, are they still around all of that stuff but uh, we might have to wait to get more information about something like that so we'll have to see but yeah. you know what we're at the middle of the show we've got some patrons to thank and some other stuff to do real quick so let's do that and then we'll get back to the rest of the episode message coming in patching it through i am sovereign and this station is mine i like the sound of that all right, here we are in the middle of the episode, and we've got a few things to cover. First, we've got some new patrons, Meiji Moos, and we also have a brand new Shepherd Tier patron, Hool the Fool. Hool, thanks for being awesome and signing up. And thank you to all of our Shepherd Tier patrons, Hool the Fool, Apollo, and Pipe Man. Apollo upgraded this last uh, this last month also. So three Shepherd Tier patrons right now. 44 patrons all together. Thank you, everybody who takes the time to head over to patreon.com and check out all the different tiers and pick one that you guys like to help support the show. Uh, Sam and I do appreciate it because you guys help support us and help support creating more content like this and uh, make this a, a part time thing for Sam, help supporting him and in a, in a part of my full time content creation career so very very much we appreciate it and if we've done anything to help you get through your work day your workout your drive to work or your purchasing of shepherd's pie and eating it while doing a podcast then go to patreon.com slash mass effect lorecast to check out all the different tiers we can get ad free episodes or even t-shirts and we're coming up on pretty soon our second set of shirts are going to be going out to patrons or your first if you've signed up at tier four or higher since the the first set of t-shirts going out then you, you would be getting your first shirts so go check that stuff out it's all on the patreon and um let's see we've got also have some uh some new reviews to cover real quick uh we got two new ones that i'm aware of we have uh this one from 
Le Bubba Fett from Great Britain, which is funny because that sounds French, but uh, uh, Le Bubba Fett from uh, uh, Scotland specifically says, thank you from Scotland. Five stars. I have been a fan of Mass Effect since the release of Mass Effect 2, 12 years ago now. Oh my God making us feel old and have been falling in love all over again with the legendary edition. I found your podcast in order to gain further insight into the lore and engage with the community. I wanted to give extra thanks for the music episode. It was so interesting and a great overview of video game music as a whole. Plus as a proud Scott myself, hearing the bagpipes made it all the more special. That's awesome. Thanks for an amazing podcast every week. Love Abigail from Glasgow, Scotland. That's so awesome. And then we have another one from, oh, well, thank you. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, uh, Abigail. Uh, very, very appreciated of that review. And um, I'm sure the guys who put together that episode will be really, really uh, thankful for hearing you mention them on this. Um, also, we have one from Bell SR2 in Great Britain as well, who wrote, so glad I found this five stars. Stumbled on this podcast after seeing an ad on Twitter, which is super weird because we don't pay to advertise so if somebody else out there is paying to advertise our podcast for us thank you i guess i think it could have been a uh <laughs> one of those things where twitter it, knows you're into a certain topic right so it, like, yeah it shows you yeah. or somebody retweeted something but if somebody is advertising our show for us and just not telling us that's also really cool like thanks um I don't know if that's possible, but thank you. Uh, awesome insights into a great game and awesome community. So glad I found this. None of my friends are interested in Mass Effect, so it's refreshing to hear the excitement and knowledge you guys have for the game. Uh, so thank you, Bell SR2, uh, for taking the time to do this. If you listen on Apple Podcasts or you even have an Apple account and you want to take the time to log in and leave us a five star rating and a review, we'll read it out on a future episode of the show. It really does help. People know what they're going to be getting when they listen to this and find out if it's a good show to listen to. Also, if you are one of like the 50% of people who listen on Spotify, you can leave a rating on there. That also really helps because Spotify will rank shows according to the aggregate rating of stars. So if you leave us a five star rating on there, that would be amazing. All you have to do is just go to the, go to the page where you can see the list of all the episodes. Scroll to the top, look on the top left side. You'll see a little button you can click and leave us a five star rate rating right there. That would help a ton. So if you're listening right now, right now on Spotify, just take a take a moment and go do that. It w- it'll help us a ton. We'd really appreciate it. Um, let's see. What else do we have to do in the middle of the show, Sam? Well, you know, I'm putting out another uh, announcement out there because we're still looking for those science minded experts from the community to talk about things like FTL, mass relays and, you know, how how close are we to something like that in real life? How much of a pipe dream is it? If you know any of the science behind some of the concepts in Mass Effect and and again, that could be anything from astrophysics to chemistry to biology, you name it. Um, We'd love to talk to you, you know. Uh, if you work in that field or if you know someone who does, just reach out to us. Of course, we're on the Discord, the Robots Radio Discord and the Mass Effect Lorecast channel. Uh, and you can also get us over Twitter at Mass Effect Cast or on email, Mass Effect Lorecast at gmail.com. Yep. And uh, again, thank you to all of our patrons. You guys are the best. All right, let's move on with the rest of the show. Spit it out. Or are you trying to build suspense? You're so dense, sir. Obviously, I do not know as much about human relationships as I thought. All right. So there has to be some instances where the black and white thinking of the Justicars left gaps. Or what happened if the law didn't line up with the code? Right? Like getting back to this whole code thing. Did they just commit suicide from the dissonance? Like... What do you do? Like, what do they do when they're like, well, these two things don't match up and it's not it's absolutely not clear. Like we gave a weird example before where it was like innocent, but guilty. And so guilty. But like, what about when things just like are absolutely at like a standstill, like a stagnant point and they just don't know what to do? Right here on Earth, meaning the literal planetary body and in reality, (laughs) we know that uh, life is is full of shades of gray. It's not black and white. So there would naturally be some kind of issues that arise from viewing the world as black and white and uh, wanting to uphold law, but also having your own set of laws. So a couple of points. Number one, 
there's a third oath of subsumation. The third oath is made for this gray area. And the codex says it requi requiring a Justicar to swear loyalty that overrides the dictates of even the Justicar code. The third oath is usually involved in matters where even the black or white thinking of Justicars is forced to concede the existence of gray. Mm. This makes sense in the context of the collector threat. Because Asari Justicar is wanting to uphold Asari ways of life, Asari codes, um, you know, protecting the innocent and whatnot. They're really only confined to Asari space. So the collectors wouldn't be a concern for the Justicar code normally. So it makes sense why Samara would then activate the third or swear the third oath of subsumation to be under Shepard's command. Um, but we know from Samara that if the Justicars are forced to do something wrong, aka something against their code, or something extremely dishonorable, they will kill their superior after leaving their service. <laughs> after that allegiance ends, they'll they'll kill him. So uh, Shepard was kind of taking some risks there, huh? A little bit. Uh, spicy recruitment, I would say. Yeah, <laughs> that's quite the NDA, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, and, and we also know from Samara that the Justicars prefer not to know the details that can make situations more gray. Right, like don't tell this me is the, don't tell me the facts here. Just let me do my mission. Yeah, right, because it interferes with their code. Um, if a guilty person has a redeeming quality, Samara doesn't want to know. Mm -hmm. Which, in my opinion, is really morally fucked up. <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, absolutely. But then again, like you mentioned, it's not about the moral reasoning. It's the legal reasoning. They are prosecutors. Right. They're not defense attorneys. Right. They're prosecutors. They just want the prosecution. And I, I guess that was what clicked for me in my head when I was looking this up, is that they're not like Justicars are not necessarily good people. Right. <laughs> like, right. They're just they're just agents of order and law. And like if they're going this far as to not like they don't even want to consider extraneous circumstances like like, OK, yeah, he killed him. But you don't understand. Like it was this whole big thing and it was self-defense. And, you know, mm -hmm. like it or, doesn't matter. Oh, According yeah. to the law, this is the result. So therefore, I'm going to follow through with what happens right like they don't yeah. care that jean valjean stole the loaf of bread because he was <laughs> starving valjean. and needed to <laughs> yeah right <laughs> and starving and needed to, to to feed his family they don't care he broke the law in this in this metaphor to les miserables <laughs> the yes. justicars are javert right right which i was immediately turned off by that uh when i first tried to read that book in school because i the, as soon as i realized that there was a main character who had the same name twice i was like this book is dumb <laughs> jeans val jeans this was is so like, stupid i was like jean val jean why would you name this character with the same name twice this author must be stupid and i put brother it to brother to george val george <laughs> <laughs> capris val capris i was like what is this this can't be a good book <laughs> yeah um so yeah, th like I said, it's just morally so fucked up to not like, I don't really care about the truth. The truth is going to get in my way. Mm -hmm. It's going to get well, in my way. It's not the truth. Like it's, it's information that doesn't change the result of the legal situation. But I mean, like if you're looking at someone as a whole, you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. if you want the truth about who they are as a whole, right. Before right. judging them. Right. But but according to the law, that's not going to change the like in a courtroom. Like if, for example, if I was to steal a loaf of bread using the Jean Valjean example. Right. And the law says if you get caught stealing a loaf of bread, you will be fined fifty dollars. Right. It doesn't matter if, if I stole the loaf of bread from you. It doesn't matter in the eyes of the judge if I petition the judge and say, yes, but my family was starving. And I've been a good member of society and I've donated this much money to legal like causes into the church. And I mean, whatever. you could get a lighter sentence, right? Maybe, but I'm still I still broke the law. So therefore, I will be paying the price for the thing. Right. Um, yeah. 
like but for just a cars it doesn't seem like this sentence is you could be fined up to five hundred dollars it's always five hundred dollars but maybe that's the you way I mean? but maybe that's the way their legal system is maybe there is no wiggle room yeah maybe there is there, no I lighter mean, sentence for good behavior or something like that maybe there is simply the you get caught doing x the punishment is y regardless wiggle room the tale of the forbidden just a car <laughs> <laughs> yeah maybe there's no maybe there's no variance maybe maybe it's just simply you get caught doing x crime you pay this price and that's it like you right. you speed 10 miles over the speed limit and there's this is what you get paid there's no like well the cop's gonna let you off this time right it doesn't you matter. did x you're punished y right yeah. like it doesn't matter that like oh his wife was in the passenger seat and needed to get to the <laughs> to the emergency room like no you're still paying the freaking fine like that's just the yeah. way the law works it's that rigid that might yeah. be the case it could be it, it could very well be um it could also be because they filled that gap like we talked about that needed the fast judgment so right. there really was no time to debate right yeah yeah so that could be that could be the other reason why um and it seems like if they make an error they're willing to own up to it anyway like the code would have them own up so it's not like they're shirking their responsibility i mean maybe tristana being a former justicar is because with how rogue and renegade she is i think that's probably why she left the justicar order mm -hmm. um and 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 the other point about what you mentioned about the the committing suicide from the dissonance um the ritual suicide thing that is not part of the code uh, that we know of could be but not that we know of um because you know the committing suicide because you're so conflicted well spoilers spoilers big spoilers here if you don't want the spoilers don't listen for the next 30 seconds but samara's choice at the monastery is totally her choice when at in mass effect 3 you remember if you are there to help Samara and, and the monastery, which is being attacked and the Ardat Yakshi might get out, as we know, Samara's daughters are Ardat Yakshi. They are at that monastery and they ease it. Like the monastery is uninhabitable. The Reaper forces have taken it over, right? And so the options are leave Samara's daughters there to die <laughs> or violate the code and take the Ardat Yakshi away from the monastery when given this option samara chooses regardless of the outcome because you can you can change the outcome a number of ways but samara chooses to put a gun to her head and she's going to commit suicide and um that choice is not dictated by the code that's something that she's doing because she can't bring herself to ex to execute the code yeah that's do that's, that's something that she's out. choosing because she's choosing the love of her daughters above the code. Right. Right. It's, yeah. it's her way out, out of the code. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, so, but they're, they're not willing to give up their autonomy all the time. Right. Right. They're not. Um, the code says to relinquish to authorities for one day, if police question the motives and methods that the just car is using. So they can relinquish to those authorities for a day. And then after that point, if they're still, you know, detained or imprisoned, they will fight their way out. Um, so interesting because it presumes the possibility of corrupt law enforcement, doesn't it? That the code would uh, make that provision within it, you know, mm -hmm. don't allow yourself to get imprisoned longer than a day. Yeah. Because maybe the person you're investigating is also the police chief. Right, right. So interesting there and it brings up a good point right um because if, if we're talking about legitimacy legitimacy in government legitimacy and authority where do you derive your authority from show me your badge you know that kind of thing mm -hmm. um where does the legitimacy of, of just a cars come from they're widely revered we know this they're made into somewhat of a myth they're romanticized even for you know for their prowess and their knowledge they're almost you know like i said mythic but where does that legitimacy actually come from there's no legal document there's no magna carta enshrining the authority and legitimacy of the justicars it, they're just a cult who came about you know and then mm. they kicked enough ass that they became <laughs> well known enough yeah they, they're like culturally uh 
approved of or tolerated. Yeah. And I see a couple questions here in chat asking how Samara became a just car when she had three children. She became a just car after she had three children. And it was because those children were art at Yakshi. So she was able to, to basically say they are no longer my children. They are the uh, inhabitants of the monastery and they are under the monastery's uh, guise now or, you know, uh, rule now. And um, what is that? Uh, guardian. The, the, they are, you know, she gave a conservatorship. Up, right. She gave up uh, parental rights over them. Or yeah. Whatever, right? And one of them, of course, you know, spoilers, one of them, of course, didn't want to go to the monastery and then fled and became a captive. So she did become a Justicar to find Morinth and then bring her in. Um, and also because she felt, I think, a level of guilt for the havoc that she had unintentionally released on the galaxy because there was this psychopathic sex killer <laughs> on the loose. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, there's that. And then, uh, but you know, about the, about their authority, even law enforcement respect their authority. They're scared shitless by Samara. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, and that is apparently more culturally derived than legal because they, there's no apparent, I don't think there's any police regs that say, let, let the justicars do what they must. It's just kind of like a, we revere and respect you mm -hmm. as long as you're not like killing innocent people or who we think are innocent, we're not going to get in the way. Right. You do your thing. We'll do our thing and we'll just kind of not get in each other's way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's not like they particularly like Justicar's police because they complain about it. And I get it. If I was a cop, I would not want some, you know, special forces badass who was not beholden to anything, mm -hmm. just going in my town and, and mucking up investigations left and right because they're on a dead set thing for the code. Like a fin like imagine a special forces badass who's a fanatical believe like believer in some religion. Right. Yeah, you know what I like. That's terrifying, actually. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, that's. I'm sure there are people out there. <laughs> like that's. Yeah, it's not too far fetched, but yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. actually, didn't know Osama bin Laden receive special forces <laughs> training at uh -huh. some point. Yeah, yeah, that he would count as one. Um, I don't know if that's a wise idea for us to equivocate Justicars <laughs> to to uh, the world's uh, most infamous terrorist, but. You know, yeah. we went there anyway, because this is the Mass Effect lore cast and you heard it here first. Yeah. Well, he was hunting down people outside of his culture. So that's different. Um, people who he deemed were against his code. Against his code, but from outside of right. his own culture. Like, right. In this situation, they're they're not hunting down people outside their culture. They are they are stopping people within their culture from breaking the law. Oh, they're also hunting down um, criminals that are not Asari as well. But within their own cultural space. Asari space. Their yes. own Asari space. So, yeah. whereas uh, if we were to equivocate this to our own world, Osama bin Laden was outstretching his own space. <laughs> and like... Certainly. A attacking people in their own <laughs> homes and countries and things. Certainly. So, but the yeah. black and white thing, it becomes dangerous. <laughs> yes, <laughs> As right. you can see. Absolutely. Um, yeah, yeah. So... Um, Imagine law enforcement is scared, right? They're nervous because that's how lawful neutral the Justicars are. They're so lawful neutral that, and they're so high on the lawful scale mm -hmm. that they genuinely don't care. They smell one hint of corruption within that police department and you're dead. Oh yeah. 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 They, so yes, absolutely. And yeah. And, and on top of that, they probably don't have a whole lot of tolerance for like, Hey, you got this wrong. Your interpretation of this is incorrect. Let me explain this to you. If that's even legitimately what's going on, like maybe they, maybe they're just misinformed, you know, like sometimes misinformation happens, you know, like this isn't, this legitimately isn't what it looks like. Not, yeah, you know, they're not forgiving, not like, Hey, let me wiggle out of this. But like, no, for real, this looks bad, but it actually isn't when you, when I give you all the facts, um, because sometimes that happens. <laughs> So, um, okay. So we, at the beginning of the episode, we talked about the Asari commandos also. So why don't we dig into that for a little bit right here at the end of the episode? Yeah. 
Yeah, we 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 uh, given what we talked about before, I think we needed to go into the Asari commandos. You know, we talked about the STG. We talked about the Spectres, the N7s, uh, you name it. So we definitely got to talk about the Asari commandos. I will say that there's not a lot that we know about them. There's just not. I wish that we knew more about how the Asari commandos trained. We do not. Um, but you know how I, how we said that the Asari had loose city state governments for most of their history. Yeah. Well, no surprise. Their militaries also were kind of like that. Their militaries resembled a collection of tribal warrior bands with no national structure for a large part of their history. And so the commandos are no exception. The commandos are part of the Asari military. They are the best of the best in the military. And unlike Justicars, they're usually in their maiden stages. The Justicars have already, like, the Justicars are at that point in their lives because they've already acquired centuries of knowledge. Yeah. And and now that the the commandos are like the young bucks, right? They're <laughs> they're in the maiden stages. Um so they're no exception. And unlike the Justicars, um, They've only spent about 20 to 30 years studying martial arts. Now I say only only because someone who studies 30 years of martial arts in our world, right? Is a freaking badass. Like, right. Is an expert. Yes. They are. They're like Jackie Chan. They're like the dragon, you know, dragon. Yeah. Rank. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So absolutely. And, and these, um, these Asari commandos, they specialize in guerrilla warfare. They specialize in hit and go type tactics. That sounds very STG, doesn't it? They, they, they hit, Mm -hmm. then they retreat, they hit, then they retreat. And interestingly enough, they don't fight in groups. They fight independently or in duos. Huh? So only in ones and twos. And -hmm. I'm getting a theme here because both the Justicars and the commandos apparently like to be alone. I'm wondering if this is part of that famous Asari arrogance that we've seen in the game. Also, this sounds like a good way to introduce a Street Fighter type game in the Mass Effect universe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, I mean, <laughs> Asari Commandos would make a pretty good uh, Street right. Fighter. I'm going to pick Effect the Asari edition. Commando. I'm going to pick the Spectre. All right, let's go. <laughs> Fight. <laughs> One on one, though one-on-one uh they are the most feared warriors in the galaxy no one wants to fight one one on one uh not even shepherd i imagine and that is something we hear very often you know um big surprise some of the first specters were actually asari commandos i mean it kind of seems like they've been trained for it and just like the specters their records are sealed too typically for five thousand years that's and interesting (laughs) that the lore says typically right because uh-huh. like i guess it could be sooner if the asari commando in question wants to share their records i guess it's not exactly like the asari are well known for sharing their secrets mm-hmm. <laughs> so yeah um yeah typically five thousand years so the last time you know on average let's say that at the beginning of mass effect one <laughs> and the asari commando shared their their records the last time that happened was 3000 BC. Yeah, we were starting to build some pyramids back then. Yeah, uh, that's fucking crazy. Uh, the Codex says that they're unbeatable, the Asari Commandos. And by the way, we're saying Commandos, but they've also been known by another name in the uh, games, which is Asari Huntresses. Those are the same thing, Commandos and Huntresses. I guess the writers just switched up the verbiage at some point. Um, But the Codex describes them as unbeatable and they combine extremely deadly biotics with, quote, a dancer's grace. Oh. Yeah. So I love that. A quick note about biotics in the Asari military. It's so important. And, you know, Asari are all born uh, with biotic capabilities, but not all of them develop those tendencies. So not all of them use biotics. Um, the lack of biotic talent in any recruit prevents an Asari from even joining the military at all, let alone becoming a commando. Yeah, it's, it's seen as a necessity. Right. So those who become commandos have to have crazy good biotics, like right. insane. Man, Probably check out the biotics on that one. Shame. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I love her aura. I know, man. Look, it's so blue. 
everything's blue. <laughs> it's so it's, it's like it's, it's so, have you ever seen someone with such blue aura? And it's the listeners like, can't so see blue. this. But on the live show, Tom is wearing a blue sweatshirt and he's got blue lights behind him. I'm uh-huh. wondering if he did this on purpose. I mean, it's a pretty, pretty, pretty solid plan. If you did. I'm shooting biotic bolts and stuff at people. That's the sound it makes. We're blasting right? their ear holes blasting. with our biotics. Yeah. Um, so, oh, and speaking of clothing, you know, you ever wonder why there's no consistent outfit or armor for Asari Commandos? Because it seems like in Mass Effect 1, they're wearing one thing. Mass Effect 2, they're wearing another thing, you know. They're just that, well, that fashion forward. It could be because this is actual lore. This is this is in the lore. Everyone in the Asari military is allowed to wear whatever they want. That's pretty cool. <laughs> it's not very uniform, democracy. but no, no <laughs> uniform. <laughs> Um, it could also be because some of them turn to mercenary work. Mm. So we know some mm. of the commandos are in the Eclipse gang. We know some of the commandos end up being uh, matriarchs bodyguards. So it's not like they're conscripted and they can't work for anyone else. Mm-hmm. It kind of seems like they become private military contractors. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, and then they can wear whatever they want. Now the wiki says different. The wiki says that they all wear brown and green. But I swear I've seen some Asari commandos in the games that are not wearing brown and green. Mm. So I'm going to differ from the wiki here. Uh, mm. This is going to be the hill that I die on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe, if, maybe we should have people send in pictures. Like, find how many different outfits can you find Asari commandos wearing? So um, we uh, we know of some of the uh, major operations from some of these other groups. What about the uh, Asari commandos? You know, for as much as we hear about how intimidating and badass they are, we hear shockingly little about their operations, uh, which could be because the writers didn't get to it, or it could be because their records are sealed, right? 5,000 years. I mean, humans haven't been on the world stage or the galactic stage for 5,000 years, so it might be a Not while. Even half of it. <laughs> right. Yeah. So it might Not be even a quarter. <laughs> right. So it might be a long time before the humans get any word of any of this stuff oh yeah long time in the future we can understand oh yeah that one thing that happened in mass effect 3 that was because of an asari commando right right yeah it's a great retroactive writing tool i think uh that's just fourth wall breaking but some notable commandos we have seen so some some commandos that we have met over the games have been shiala you remember shiala the green one from mass effect one with from the thorian the green one the green one. I always, the green thought, one. I always thought Shiala should be romanceable. Mm. Mm. Because she's like the black sheep of the Asari. You know, she's green. Mm-hmm. How many of them are green? I think just her. Like, at all? Yeah. I think the, the skin tones range from blue and light blue to purple. Right. But I don't think but, anyone's green. Yeah. Like, now that you point it out, why is there only one green one? Well, that was because her skin was permanently changed after being uh, absorbed by the Thorian. All oh, right. Yeah, I haven't, yeah, and, I haven't thought uh, about this. Huh. And I guess after Shepard took care of the Thorian on Mass Effect 1, her skin was like, it returned to its normal color for a little bit, but then it like returned to green over the years after the Thorian was gone. Oh, that's so weird. And we know this when we meet back up with her in Mass Effect 2. Um, so she's one. She was an Asari commando. Obviously, she went rogue because she was in mercenary work. She was working for Benezia when Benezia was effectively working for Saren. So that was uh, pretty rogue. Um, and unlike the Justicars, it seems members of other races can indeed be Asari commandos. We know this because Cora Harper in Mass Effect Andromeda doesn't let us forget that she trained with the Asari commandos. Hmm. She is incessant about it. And f- fun fact about Cora Harper, uh, she, well, I'll put it this way. The elusive man's name is Jack Harper. Mm-hmm. Do you really think that's a coincidence? Mm-hmm. Yeah. No. Yeah. So do humans have to train for 20 to 30 years? I don't think so. Cora's like, (laughs) yeah, in her 20s. She's in her like 12s. 
Well, that's technically my, 612. Yeah, that's my, <laughs> she's my been running. Frozen. If anybody who's listening to this says the first episode, that's my running joke that all the characters in that game look like they're 12. But um, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. They all they 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 look disproportionate. Um, yes. Yeah. Um, but Cora. Cora gets annoying as hell about that Asari <laughs> Commando thing. She really does. She's like, "Did I ever tell you that I trained with the com- with the Asari Commando?" Yes, you did, Cora. Um, uh-huh. Uh-huh. And I wonder how she afforded that kind of thing. Oh man. Well, w- if only my dad was the head of a you know inter- a galactic terrorist organization with uh, funds coming in from arms manufacturers. Yeah, yeah. That's a real yeah. pro-human there, buddy. Yeah, there's another one. There's another notable commando that we've all met. And something that I learned while I was researching for this episode, Arya Talok. Arya actually was a commando. Hmm. And I didn't know this. I also didn't know how how old Arya Talok is. She's over a thousand years old. That's really so, old. Yeah, Carrie Ann Moss has aged pretty well. Wow. Wow. Yeah, so we'll talk more about Arya uh, when we get to her individual character episode. But yeah, that's pretty much the extent of what we know about the Commandos. Um, not a lot, but I did want to talk about them, and I felt like the Justicar episode was the right place to do it. Yeah, no, it fits in. That makes sense. So yeah. what are we going to cover next week? Next week, we are talking about the Andromeda Initiative. And I know our Andromeda fans who have been listening to this show have probably been waiting long enough for us to talk and and dive in deep about an Andromeda uh, topic. But we are going to be covering that faction, the Initiative, uh, next week. Cool. Cool. Well, thanks, everybody, for tuning in. And um, I love all the comments from our live viewers. You guys are awesome. You have anything cool you want to share before we head out, Sam? Uh, Yeah, I'll try and keep it brief. So um, I'm streaming every Monday and Saturday. Got Sassy Shepherd Saturdays on uh, going right now. So I'm doing my (laughs) Renegade uh, first Femship playthrough. That's from three to six Pacific, uh, six to nine Eastern. And on Mondays, it's miscellaneous Mondays. It's a rotating slew of games. Um, Last week I did uh, Milf Rider Mondays. That's what I named my (laughs) Rider in Andromeda. Uh, He's a total, total catastrophe. Uh, But I, on, on every Monday, I send out a poll on Twitter of two games to choose from and then i let my followers just decide what which game i'm going to play that's great uh so i'm going to do that tomorrow as well haven't picked the options yet so point is uh streaming saturday mondays uh three to six uh uh, three to six pacific six to nine eastern and if you're interested in stopping by follow follow me on twitch at n7 the legend or find me on twitter if you want to have a you know a hand in what i'm playing on mondays uh that's also at n7 the legend Awesome. And right when you're done on Mondays, uh, we start up the Witcher Lorecast. So right right when you're done with that, you can come over and w- hang out. We'll do the Witcher Lorecast talking about uh, we're almost done wrapping up our review and some insight about the episodes of season two on Netflix and uh, covering all that stuff. So if you're a fan of the Witcher, the Witcher show, the games, the books, um, you can come hang out with us while we talk about that. Of course, that podcast is up everywhere. You can check out all the different shows on robotsradio.net, including all of the other shows that I do, all the different lore casts. Um, Mass, Mass Effect is here. But then there's, of course, uh, Fallout and Elder Scrolls and Cyberpunk. And um, any of the stuff that I do can be found on twitch.tv slash robotsradio or the main channel, which is the YouTube Robots Radio channel, where all of the stuff is streamed in multiple places, but then you can catch all the videos I do also. And almost every day of the week in the evenings after 9 p.m. Eastern, which is like, what, 6 p.m. Pacific, there's a stream with a show to watch or video games or something for you guys to hang out and do. And of course, you can catch me and Sam over on the Robots Radio Discord, where you can send us some notes about anything and everything. You can hang out with the community. You can join our Minecraft server and hang out with the community over there. You can play all sorts of different games. We play all the games that we have shows about. There's all sorts of fun stuff to do. And um, it's probably the nicest community on the internet, which is a breath of fresh air because there's so many toxic people and everybody who's part of our community is just awesome and helpful and, you know, just pleasant to be around, which is kind of an amazing thing. So thank you all for being a part of our, our community and just for being awesome. Um, yeah, two girls, one ship says the Discord community is the best. So thanks for being here. You guys are the best. We'll be back next week. And until then, stay safe out there in the galaxy and uh, 
you know, if you happen to, you know, turn into a commando or just a car or something, then, you know, kick some ass or something. I don't know. See you guys later. Bye, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to the Mass Effect Lorecast. We'd love to hear your opinion and thoughts on the lore of Mass Effect. Reach out to us on Twitter at Mass Effect Cast or check out the Robots Radio Discord. Also, you can send us an email at Mass Effect Lorecast at gmail.com.